There's a rising tide of populism and tribalism today. And in response to that, Francis Fukuyama, a prominent public intellectual, has come to the defense of America's political economic system. Fukuyama views it as rooted in classical liberalism. And his book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, attempts to vindicate this system. Why is this system losing? What would it take to defend it properly? And how well does Fukuyama do in this project? Welcome to the podcast. I'm Ilan Jerno. Joining me today is Nikos Soterikopoulos. Hi, Nikos. Hello. So I think the place to start is just to set some context for people. Who is Francis Fukuyama? Why should we listen to what he has to say? What is the thrust of what he's doing here? So maybe you can lead us off with that. Yes, so Francis Fukuyama's most uh, prominent claim to fame, and where most people might have heard him, is from an essay that he wrote in 1989, actually before the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is his essay about the end of history. What was the end of history? The end of history is his prediction that liberal democracy has reached a stage of un almost universal acceptance and also it's a system that works and therefore sooner or later it would be adopted by everyone. Even then though, Fukuyama does not make the case that liberal democracy is the only system which is compatible, let's say, with human nature or that it's the only moral system. He's just making the claim that it is a system that works, that it is a system which is quite good in negotiating conflict, in negotiating a diversity of different groups of people with different uh, ideologies, beliefs, and therefore it would sooner or later be the dominant system. So some months later, the Berlin Wall fell. Two years later, the Soviet Union fell. So many people said that Fukuyama was a prophet of our time, uh, someone who, could force, who managed to foresee and predict that these days, classical liberals, uh, sorry, uh, liberal democracy so he makes sure that he points out that classical liberalism and liberal democracy are not exactly the same thing. So we will see what he means by liberalism. But liberalism has been the only game in town. This was Fukuyama in the 90s and the 2000s. Again, he was considered that he had this great prediction about the root of history that was verified. Now, what do we see these days? We see within liberal societies, various groups and ideologies attacking liberalism. So from the left, we have identity politics. From the right, we have nationalism or ethno-nationalism or the new right, however you want to call it. So Fukuyama noticed this. He also noticed that there is an outside threat to liberalism. And he mentions regime like Vladimir Putin's Russia, or he also mentions Viktor Orban, and he calls this threat ethno-nationalism. So a model that wants to become a new alternative to classical liberalism and to liberal democracy. Therefore, in a way, Fukuyama is declaring that what you people thought was the end of history is not the end of history. Liberalism has, again, discontents. This is why his new book is called Liberalism and its Discontents. And he rises up to give a defense of liberal democracy. So it's nice and poetic in a way. The guy who 30 years ago, the political scientist, who the, 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 the very well-respected political scientist, who gave the verdict that liberal democracy looks like it's going to be the only game in town, 30 years later says uh, liberal democracy is not anymore the only game in town. It faces threats. And I am here to defend it against these threats. And this is his uh, latest book, Liberalism and Its Discontent, which came out a couple of months ago. I, I haven't got a physical copy, I've got it on Kindle, so I cannot show it to people, but they can see it on our screen. Yeah, yeah, just to add to what you're saying in terms of Fukuyama's prominence, you mentioned the, the essay and then a later book uh, on the same theme about the so-called end of history that has made him really prominent. He's written a lot of work. He's a, a productive scholar, many, many books after that one. And it's, it's really interesting to see as a indicator of where the culture is, where someone as prominent as he is, as, as deeply knowledgeable about political thought as he is, how he understands this issue, because 
he's one of the best minds the culture has produced. He's at, uh, I think he's affiliated with Stanford. He used to be at um, Johns Hopkins. He's had a really illustrious career. And in that respect, it's, it's, it, we'll come to what he has to say, but just to, in terms of thinking about how people view things, you want to look at people who are really prominent, part of um, uh, credible intellectual uh, spaces. So let's talk a bit about uh, liberalism in the title of the book. So I think this is an important piece of context for everyone uh, listening because, and he goes into this as well in the book, because it, where you are in Europe, liberalism has a certain meaning, whereas in the US, it has a different meaning. And he's trying to just clarify what his target is. So uh, if I can summarize it, and then you, if you want to add to this. So in the US, when you talk about liberals, Typically, what's understood in, if you talk about in newspapers and in radio, sort of a conven in mainstream discussions, just means the left or what now are called progressive. So just sort of associated with the Democratic Party, but just that part of the intellectual political landscape. Whereas in Europe, it has a, a bit more of an intellectual flavor, which is it, it's more connected to the historical development of what's now called classical liberalism. It's not associated with sort of political party directions. Uh, I mean, does that cover how you understand it? It does cover how we understand it. And uh, in Europe, it has more to do with classical liberalism. Now, the interesting thing with Fukuyama is he claims that the way he uses the term liberalism is distinct from both. He doesn't mean the American progressives. He doesn't mean European classical liberals. But if you see his definition, which he describes liberalism as a combination of a belief in a universalism, inequality in front in, in in the face of the law, that every person is an end in himself or in herself, and that there is a respect of uh, the freedom of transaction and property rights. To me, it sounds more like classical liberalism. Although Fukuyama seems to have a, dif a difficult, he seems to be uncomfortable in openly saying, "Yes, I'm talking about classical liberalism." So. Elan, you you have more to say on how he defines liberalism. Yeah, I want to come to that, um, but I want to just establish as as well what is it he's responding to? Because I think what interested me, the reason I read this book, I, I read it uh, as soon as I noticed it came out. I said, I have to read this. I want to see what he has to say because what he's reacting to is a real issue. I mean, there's definitely something going on in the culture. The phenomenon that he, the various things he's analyzing need explanation and they are significant what things to worry about so some of what he's i mentioned when we set up the conversation the the rise of so-called populism you describing so this ethno-nationalism coming from various parts of the so-called right and nationalism itself is a, is a newly prominent uh, doctrine and if you step back a decade, you think about the the last major economic convulsion was the the financial crisis of two thousand eight nine and onward, and that I think was a a uh, an earthquake in the sense that it really shook people's view about what they regard as sort of the the free market. Now I don't regard it as a free market. I don't think we have to talk a bit about that, but. It, when people think about what were the consequences of that going forward, the, the, there's a whole narrative about inequality in economic space. And this is something that Fukuyama talks about. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, but the issue is the attacks on the, the current political economic system as it exists today, as Fukuyama recognizes it, as we recognize it as an ongoing venture, they're real and they're important to understand, they're important to respond to, uh, and then the question becomes, what is it we're dealing with? What, what kind of society are we in? Should you call it a classical liberal society? Is liberalism the thing you want to, is this the hill you want to die on? Is this the, the issue that really needs to be defended? And then what exactly, how exactly to think about the situation we're in? So just a couple of, uh, I'll address some of those questions I raised. One is, I think it's a mistake to think about where we are today as as an ideal system that needs to be defended. I mean, the system we have today is a hugely mixed economy of both significant elements of freedom, but massive and growing elements of controls economically. There's a, a, a merging of state and economics to the degree that I think would, would shock people who have not really looked into it. 
there are pockets that are freer and that's important to recognize. So the tech space is a lot freer, but if you think about, if you work in finance or in banking, you can't move without checking a box that is required for some bureaucratic legal form. So there are real problems with the society we live in. And part of the, the, the task for, if you're trying to defend is to, what are the good things that need to be defended? And what are the bad things here? And that is not something that Fukuyama is really interested in. And what's the wider philosophic framework? What are the values that you should be thinking about here? And so this is where I think part of what Ayn Rand brings to this, the, the whole context she brings to this is hugely illuminating. And you see, because Fukuyama doesn't have any sort of philosophical framework that's nearly as useful, he can't really get started in neither understanding where we are or where we should be. So part of the analysis I think you get from Ayn Rand is that you need to understand what the ideal is. And the ideal society is not the mixed economy we're living in. It's a capitalist society. And that depends on a moral foundation, which is moral individualism or egoism fundamentally. And that this is the society that's proper for human beings to live in because you need to be free to act on your mind's judgment and to trade. And so, and so there's a whole analysis she has about what is the ideal society. And then using that as a framework, where are we now? What aspects of today need to be defended versus need to be criticized? And there's a lot to criticize today. And that's part of what she does. Now, Fukuyama comes into this and he just dives midstream into where we are today. And he then tries to say, well, this is something to defend. This is something not to defend. And, and the intellectual framework he brings, this idea of individualism, he's not even passionate about it. You, you, I mean, there's no evidence in the book that he think that, yeah, I want to, this is the, to use that metaphor again, that this is the hill I want to die on. It, this is the one ideal I think we all need to, to champion. None of that's present. So there's confusion from the beginning. There's a lack of an intellectual perspective. Like there's no idealism coloring his perspective. Like what should society look like versus where we are? And then it just goes downhill from there. So, I, I mean, do, do you have other things you want to want to add it back to you before I start ripping into what so I think you is going on? You mentioned that here? Ayn Rand uh, gives a, a moral defense of the society that she envisions, which is a society based on the ideas of the Enlightenment and which had as its starting point the Industrial Revolution. Not only she gives a definition and she explains clearly what are the pillars based on which this society is based, but she makes one case for this society and for this life, which is very inspiring and fascinating. Even people who don't like the ideas of Ayn Rand, it's impossible almost not to read the founding or the Atlas or Atlas Shrugged and not to be inspired by that vision. There's something inside them that says, I don't want to like it, but I have to like it. So I read Atlas Shrugged first time with one, one foot in Marxism and one foot in objectivism. It was impossible not to get inspired. So it's important, first of all, to explain very clearly what is this system, for lack of a better word, that you want to defend, but also to explain us why it's worth defending it. And Fukuyama, the problem is he fails in both of these missions. He doesn't give a solid, a solid explanation, a definition, not an academic definition, but what are the principles based on which liberalism should be defend it. What is liberalism? Is it, for example, the fact that our lives are ours? If this is the case, then why later does he say that you don't have the quote unlimited freedom because sometimes you might do things that go against the conventional morality? So what? If my life is the standard, where whether I go against conventional morality is irrelevant. So the first thing is he doesn't tell us exactly what these principles that this society should be based are. And the second problem is that his defense is half-hearted. His defense is mostly that, look, we are among crazy and horrible ideas. And among these horrible ideas, here's a system which makes sure that these ideas are kept at, uh, at hand's uh, length. It, it makes sure that we save ourselves from the worst ideas out there. When we discuss this, uh, Elan, you mentioned the Churchill's uh, famous quote, democracy is the worst system, but it's better than anything else which is around. And Fukuyama in some ways makes that case for liberalism. Throughout the book, he concedes points to the enemies of liberalism, 
He concedes that it leads to inequality. He concedes that he leads to alienation. He concedes that it leads to a life which is not spiritual, whatever that means. And then he makes the case, yes, but what's the alternative? Butcher each other? So yeah, it, it, it's better than running around with Massetti. So yeah, I guess liberalism is the solution. So this is definitely not the way to defend a system. This is not the way to inspire anyone. And it's no surprise that liberalism keeps losing. There is a quote that no one really knows where it comes from, but it's a cool quote which says that if you stand for nothing, you will fall for everything, for anything or something like that. There, it's in many versions. So this is what Fukuyama, and actually not Fukuyama, this is what is the story of the life of liberal democracy since the days of the mixed economy, which is almost throughout its history. It doesn't stand for anything specific. And every few decades, it finds itself susceptible to ideologies that are horrible, but actually do stand for something. That's why it finds itself susceptible to nationalism or in the past to communism or to other forms of uh, left-wing ideas. So our message here is not that you know you have to be uh, emotionalist or to give us nice slogans, but you have to give us an explanation. Why is the system worth defending? Why is the system good? Why should the system inspire you? And Fukuyama does not do that. Yeah, so let's talk a bit about what I, I think it's useful to set up a contrast between how does Ayn Rand think of a, an ideal society? Why does she defend it? How does she think you need to move away from the present? And so what are the, the problems in the present? And I think her analysis, I think, carries forward to today. And then to, to contrast uh, Fukuyama's approach, because I think there's a really important point of contrast that goes to a philosophic issue about what is a good society. So just to set up the context, you were you were covering some of this earlier in, uh, in your points. So she thinks that Ayn Rand thinks that a good the way to think about what is the good society is to look at the individual and figure out what does an individual need to live as a moral being, and that means you need political and economic freedom to be able to act on your judgment. Your mind is your means of knowledge, your way of acquiring values, producing. And so society should be shaped around the individual's need to be left free. And so in, there's a lot more to develop, but the, the end point of that is that the ideal society is a, a laissez-faire capitalist society. And there's a lot to say again about that. And the people who, who are new to this should take a look at her analysis in capitalism, the unknown ideal. And I know capitalism can be a dirty word in many contexts, but in her view, that's part of the problem. It's been tarnished, it's been attacked by people who mischaracterize it and, and try to demonize it for illegitimate reasons. So there's a moral analysis about how the, this, the individual has rational judgment. That's the source of his ability to live. Society should be shaped around that. And Ayn Rand also has an analysis of the things that have been undermining freedom in society including things like tribalism, which Fukuyama has exercised about, including the anti-intellectualism we see from the right and the lack of defense around capitalism. And she, see, she sees that as moral cowardice. And there's a whole perspective she brings to what she regards as the betrayal of capitalism by its so-called defenders. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, con the, the setup for what I think is relevant intellectual context for thinking about some of these issues. Now let's talk about Fukuyama's analysis and his diagnosis of the problem. So you've already established that we're here to really criticize this whole approach, but let's just put it in uh, his own terms, like as strong a case as he gives. And what is the essential of his case? His view is that there's, there's something called individual autonomy, not individualism, not egoism, but individual autonomy. That's sort of the basic uh, starting point in his thinking. And that's the core of liberalism in his view. And as a result, he, what he thinks has happened is that this has been taken in both directions, both this, what he calls the right and the left. Is, both of them have taken that too far. So the right has taken individual autonomy too far in the sense of they've made a, uh, a religious uh, sort of worship of property rights and trade and economic freedom on the right. And that's gotten all, that, that's gone, uh, that's run amok. We've seen all kinds of problems economically and people are upset about that. And on the left, that's led to uh, uh, sort of subjectivism, narcissism, all kinds of bad things and, and sort of identity politics sort of as a further development of that. 
And so his view is that there's this idea of individual autonomy and both sides are taking it too far. We need to go not take it too far. Let's not, let's not go to extremes. Let's find the middle ground and let's sort of find the, the middle of the road and, and walk on it very carefully. So that's the, uh, that's the essential argument of the book. Like everyone's going too far. Let's come back to the middle. Okay, so let me say one thing about individual autonomy. Um, it's not something that he really unpacks. And I think it's important to unpack it because as it's treated in the book, it's a combination of things that are understandable or at least defensible and things that are not. So it's, it's what Ayn Rand might call a package deal. Now, I think he's using it as a package deal. There might be a context where it's, it's relevant and, and valid, but as he's using it, it's essentially complete subjectivism detached from reality. And the idea that you, might, you as an individual are warranted in making judgments and acting on them. Now, those are very different things. To, if you're making a judgment, it has to be based on evidence. It has to be follow logic. And that's very different from saying, well, I feel like it, therefore it's true and I'm going to do it. Um, and and I mean, chime in because I, I, I can see you want to say something about this sort of perspective. But to me, that's an important thing to disentangle. And then to have a view of well, how should society be organized? What does it mean to take this, to treat this consistently? He, he would say take it to extreme. But what does it mean for this to be consistently practiced? Can you do that? Uh, and that's that's one of the failings of the book. That this it starts from this confused starting point. What I find quite interesting is how Fukuyama's attempt towards the defense of liberty is on par or is in tune with attacks on liberty, bro both from the left and from the new right. Let me give an example. Fukuyama says that the problem with economic liberalism is that it was taken too far to something that he describes as neoliberalism, which is not defined, which supposedly it's the market taking over every aspect of our lives. Now, we've been hearing this argument for at least three decades from the left. The, the idea that there's such a thing as neoliberalism is a boogeyman by the left created to attack anything that resembles the ideas of the free market. So let's put this idea on the, ta on the test. Is it indeed the case that in the last decades the market has been the only game in town? Do we see, for example, in England, which is supposedly one of the, 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 the home of neoliberalism, we still see that there's a national healthcare system that no one dares to touch. We still see that the education is mostly organized through the state. We still see that state expenses go up. We still see, actually not still, more and more we see the state intervening in more and more aspects of our daily lives. So how is this neoliberalism? How is this the triumph of the ideas that we are free to interact in the market? And in the United States, we see something similar. See the volume of regulations or the scope of regulations. So it makes no sense. E empirically, there's no evidence that we live through times that there's that economic freedom is triumphant. In a way, it's the opposite. We see it these days in the UK. There's one government that dared to take some measures, some very timid measures towards uh, deregulation. And they were on a rush to make a U-turn and apologize and say, sorry, we didn't really mean it. So there's no, there's no neo quote neoliberal hegemony. This has been, uh, this has been a story from the from the left, so Fukuyama is giving is conceding too much, and actually he's factually wrong to do so. Now, what about his claim that too much individual autonomy has led to the things that we see from the left in the culture wars, identity politics, the woke mobs, and all that stuff? You know who agrees with that? People like Dave Rubin. They say that we live in this moral vacuum where there is no God and there is no um, higher authority and therefore everyone does whatever they want. As if the only way why someone would lead a life based on some set of solid values would be because some superhuman authority told us so. And Fukuyama accepts this. Fukuyama concedes this to the right. That yes, you're right, we live in this 
uh, universe without any strict uh, moral uh, code and uh, the, the, the result is identity politics. Let's put this on the test. Is identity politics indeed someone taking their individual autonomy to the extreme, so to speak? Or to use an example in, uh, from fiction, can anyone imagine that Howard Rourke, someone who consistently applies uh, the virtue of independence, of thinking, of thinking for himself, acting like uh, the mobs of protesters at university act? The answer is obviously not. So narcissism, which is thinking that I am the center of the universe without having any reason to, having any, have, without having achieved anything, and individualism, which is this belief that I have the agency and the judgment to make a difference in the world, to, to, to lead a good life. These things are not only the same, they're incompatible. It's complete subjectivism, which says I do whatever I want, is incompatible with I realize that my life is mine, my life is in my hands, and I can make something out of it. So Fukuyama sees the former, he sees subjectivism and narcissism. He sees the, what we would call me, me, me generation. It's all about me, which is I haven't achieved anything, but please recognize me, which is not individualism, because you ask other people to change the way they view you or to change the way they interact with you based on your whims. So he takes this false, let's say, individualism, and he says, well, individualism has gone too far. So both when it comes to economic liberalism going too far, and when it comes to uh, individualism, sorry, individual agency, oh, sorry, not individual agency, how did he call it? Uh, individual autonomy going too far. In both of these verdicts, he's wrong. And not only he's wrong, but he's conceding very crucial points to the enemies of, uh, of liberty. He's conceding them the moral high ground. He's saying there's open season to attack liberalism, but please don't do it the way you do it because uh, the result, if uh, your ideas are in action, is going to be slightly worse than uh, what we have today or much worse. But this is a timid, this is a half-hearted defense of liberalism. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. Uh, if there's such a thing as a quarter hearted, maybe, maybe that's more accurate because there's the, it's it's trying to defend something that is unclear, that has it doesn't have any moral fire behind it. And he doesn't have any either. And it's it's not surprising because who wants to defend a system that apparently in this telling it is all about letting individuals be complete subjectivists regardless of the facts and, and, and that that is what you're defending that's not at all what a free society is predicated on a free society should be predicated on the idea that you have a rational mind that you are creating values and trading with other people because you want their best judgment of your work you want to to appeal to their self-interest and you want to appeal to their recognition of what you're creating as a value rather than just give me money because I'm worth it. And I mean, that's just, if you boil it down to what does this look like in the marketplace? What does this look like in, in personal relationships? It, it's in your point about it's conceding a lot of ground, I think is important. We should develop that because it's, if this is your conception of what an individual is and how they behave, there's nothing to defend here. This is not what a, an ideal looks like it's you you likened it to Howard Rourke from the Fountainhead. Just think about people in your own life that you think of as admirable, people in, out in the culture that you admire. What's good about them is that they achieve things that are worth achieving, not that they sit around and indulge in their feelings and in complete disconnection from reality. Uh, so it's just, just the reality test, and, and you made the point about sort of the political economic point. I don't think that could be stressed enough. Now, I was reading this book and thinking, what reality has he been inhabiting? So let me just give a, one quote from the book. You were describing a situation in the UK. Everything that's true there applies here in the US too. And in most free societies, the trend is towards greater control, greater erosion of individual rights. And yet here's what Fukuyama's analysis comes down to. He thinks the the defect of liberalism was, quote, to carry those premises to an extreme where property rights and consumer welfare were worshipped. 
and all aspects of state action and social solidarity denigrated, end quote. So state action was denigrated. I mean, that the story of the last 12, 14 years since the financial crisis was the people rushing to expand state action in the economy, uh, even more than the previous century. And the idea of social solidarity being denigrated from every direction, all you hear is that you need to form and become some sort of member of a tribe. And unless you are part of one, you, you're left out in the, in the cold. And I mean, the, the way people think about themselves is so tribal already. It's like the, the whole idea that we've elevated it, um, the individual or the free, the, the free market versus the state, it's, it doesn't match reality. I don't recognize this world that he's describing. Uh, and if, and so your point about conceding ground, I think, is worth just expanding on. So just I'll say one thing, and if you want to say more about this, to tie it back to part of Ayn Rand's analysis, of what is the defense of capitalism? And then how, given that, should you think of the people who are standing up and saying that they're pro-freedom? How should you evaluate capitalism's defenders? Her view was that they're not doing their job properly. They're, they're failing. And her analysis, of, particularly of the, the conservatives who were the most vocal at the time as she was writing, uh, her analysis of them was that they were moral cowards. They were not willing to recognize the moral foundations of a free society, which is individualism and, and egoism. And instead, they, they tried to have their cake and eat it. They wanted the morality of self-sacrifice, the morality of altruism, the religious morality that per permeates our world and the free market, and those are incompatible, and they weren't willing to face that contradiction. And many bad things follow from that that you can read about in her analysis. And so the consequence of their making that case based on the same moral premises that were held by socialists was it to give socialism a better uh, footing. I mean, it makes it more credible, it's more consistent in this context. And so when you think about uh, an advocate for a view that concedes the fundamental, what they're doing is is not just a weak defense. It's it's no, it's worse than no defense. It's 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 selling out the basic foundations of what you're trying to put forward. And reading Fukuyama's book made me think of that because there is not an issue that he talks about. And it's interesting for a short book. It covers everything from financial crises, identity politics, regulation of uh, social media. It's like every hot topic that's been. Yeah, it covers all these. It's almost like he went through every editorial that's been published in the last 24 months and op ed issue. And so, sort of like, I've got to check the box and talk about it. And he, it's sort of like a, it's this whirlwind tour of all these issues. And on every issue, yeah, they have a point, but still we need to defend liberalism. Okay, well, to your, uh, now, your point is like, if you give the basic grounds away, if you're conceding it, who should take you seriously? Why should you defend it? The idea that there's no better alternative is not only uninspiring, it's it's false. I mean, it, it's not credible to someone. Um, and I want to, I mean, you we were talking about this before we started the recording, but the, you brought a perspective to this that I thought was really illuminating because it, it brings together some of these threads. So let me ask you this way. Suppose you had a teenage person or a student in your uni university class and come to you and, and and they're really fired up, they're idealistic, which is a good thing. It's, a, it's really admirable. Uh, what do you think their reaction would be to this book? That's, that's the most, uh, for me, the moment of clarity on why liberalism is, uh, is losing. So you have someone who is young and idealistic. On the one side, they have let's say, Marx, the Communist Manifesto, or the modern ventures, environmentalism, Bernie Sanders, uh, people who are wrong, but who are telling them, follow me to the barricades for justice. Follow me to the barricades because we are the, the pioneers in the progress of history. That puts a fire in your soul. I'm going to fight for justice for the roots of history. Or on the other side, you see people who say, follow me for uh, the aristocracy of the spirit uh, or uh, uh, the body and uh, we're going to be the, the new, uh, we're going to uh, create new worlds uh, or whatever this uh, 
the new right is saying, which is things that are inspiring. It's not a coincidence that the new right is getting so many young people and particularly young men on its, uh, on its side. And what do we have here as a defense? What do we have here, sorry, as an alternative? Someone who says, well, here's a system which it's a bit of everything and it's a middle ground, but it's a middle ground in terms that we're not going to fight. And it's a middle ground in terms that uh, it's, it's, it, delivers the, it has delivered the goods in the past and odds are it's going to do in the future. No one is going to be inspired by this. And even worse, he's going to say that the only alternative to these people who are telling me to go there and sacrifice myself and others to a cause, the only alternative are these bores. The only alternative is this vision which tells me that, well, nothing is great. Nothing is to be pursued with passion. And if you think I'm putting words in the mouth of Fukuyama, listen to the final words of the book. Not literally the final words, but one of the last uh, three, four paragraphs. He talks about the ancient Greek saying, Miden agan, which means, in a way, don't do anything in excess. And then he talks about how today's culture tells you to follow your passions. And he criticizes that something which should trouble us. Or he says, Modera quote, moderation implies and requires self-restraint. The deliberate effort not to seek the greatest emotion or the fullest accomplishment. End of quote. A deliberate effort not to seek the greatest emotion. On the one side, I've got like Putin and Tucker Carlson and Bronze Age pervert tell me to die for uh, the glory of the superior nation. On the other side, I've got the socialists telling me to go to barricades for, free, for uh, justice. And here we've got what? Moderation. And here's the wrong argument that someone might draw here. They might say that, oh, so the solution is for us also to throw emotionalist uh, slogans for sacrifice. Is this the only way to inspire? No, there is another way. And that other way is to realize what a heroic endeavor is to pursue a good life for yourself, to pursue your values, to pursue what you want, and to be free to do so. So this is why it's such a pity that the most prominent voice in defense of a free society are people like Fukuyama who are, as we said, so, so timid in the defense. Imagine if in the forefront it was Ayn Rand with her inspiring vision, with her solid and specific vision. This should be our alternative to these voices on the left and the right who say, I have a very heroic vision for you on how you're going to destroy yourself and others. And we say, no. I have a heroic vision on how to live the good life, on how to live a life of production, a life where you and others around you who cooperate with you all gain. And this is why it's, again, when will this movement understand that Ayn Rand should be on the forefront? Because as you see, we're losing. And we're losing because we're going with this half-hearted, uh, not convincing and definitely not inspiring, uh, not inspiring defense. Yeah, I would add one thing to what you're saying, which is part of the tragedy of a half-hearted defense or, or uh, incomplete or uh, uncommitted, unprincipled defense is that it, it it fails to identify what is the the ideal, as you're saying, it doesn't motivate people. But the other side of what it does is it lends credibility to the, the, the critics, the attackers, and it actually works against the thing that, so I, it works against the thing that you're supposed, you think yourself to be defending. So in the same way that def defenders of capitalism were undermining capitalism with their half-hearted defense for, for decades, by saying that capitalism's basic rationale is it serves the needy. That's not, I mean, it's a, it might do that, but that's a consequence. It's not the primary moral issue. Uh, 
in, in, in what it, that does is it changes the moral framing for what to evaluate here. And it makes capital, any failure to, to accomplish that is, well, capitalism is not doing its job and it's not good. And uh, why, who needs it? And in this context, what I, I haven't met Fukuyama, I don't really know him, but I imagine that he's really motivated by good things. I mean, I, I, I want to believe that. And I think the tragedy is I don't think this is really going to do any good. And it's going to do a lot of harm because it's going to demotivate people. It's going to make, if this is the best argument anyone can bring for, for supporting a free society, that's not very, not, who needs it? I mean, this is ridiculous. And part of the, the, what's going on is that there isn't an understanding of what a free society is. And so th this is the, uh, by not really getting that, it, it leaves people with the impression that when you talk about freedom or capitalism, this is what we're talking about. And this is what's to be defended. And that's not true. It's the wrong target. Uh, so it, it ends up, I think, uh, tarnishing both freedom and individualism, which are which are actual ideals. When you probably understand that there are things to be defended, that this is what I am inspired to defend, what I think is important. And the, the outcome is that this could, reinforces the confusions around those issues and it drains the, the whole context of moral uh, meaning. So it, to me, this is, it's uninspiring, yes, but it's gonna do, it's gonna do harm because it's not really clarifying the issue and it's gonna make the actual ideals, which are in the background, there's sort of a, there's a way in which people recognize them but don't recognize them. Uh, and the consequence is that they will look less appealing, uh, less understood and less defensible. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's, uh, it's a telling signal of where we are when this is, you know, a prominent intellectual, this is the best you've got. And it's not very good. And so, so that it doesn't look like we are uh, attacking particularly Fukuyama, which again, as you said, is a very accomplished scholar and he's definitely not a one hit wonder. So it's not only the end of history. He has had an intellectual, very prominent trajectory since then. But we see this with many classical liberals as well. So with people who are card carrying, let's say, classical liberals. And their main defense is that, well, all systems have their problems, but look what the results show and look what this graph shows. It's very important what this graph shows about rising GDP and all that stuff, because we know that a system which is principled and moral is also going to have good effects. Because what is morality? You recognize what life requires and you do it. And then you're going to have a better life. But tables and graphs about GDP are not going to win hearts and minds, particularly when you, we are facing the opponents we are facing today. I want to put one more thing, though, on the table, Elan, when it comes to a problem I had with the book. And this is that one of the main points that Fukuyama is making is that we cannot be based on rigid principles. We, can, we have to see what uh, research says, what, uh, uh, what are, uh, we have to balance various things. And then the question is, who does this? And the answer is usually, someone who is something between a central planner and a philosopher king. So we need someone like Fukuyama maybe to tell us where are the limits to our freedom or to our autonomy. Let me give you one example from his book to see why this is very, very, uh, very dangerous uh, as an attitude. Okay, so he says at some point when he's uh, criticizing, quote, neoliberalism, Quote, if Walmart or Amazon, for example, enter a market and threaten the livelihoods of, of a multitude of small mom and pop retailers, how do we judge the demands of the latter that they be protected against competition? End of quote. How do we judge the demands of the small shop to be protected from Amazon? Who is we? Why should we judge it? Do we have a right? To judge, not to judge it, but do we have a right to do something about it? Do we have a right to intervene with the freedom of Amazon so as to protect the small shop? Because if we do, then we're in a context and in a frame which is far, far away 
from where we started, where is supposedly the ideas of classical liberalism. But it gets worse. He continues after some sentences. Would France be better off if its thousands of cafes were driven out of business by Starbucks, even if the latter offered cheaper or better coffee? End of quote. First of all, that's so comical that Starbucks would ever <laughs> lead the French cafes to, to close because the French cafes have coffee, which at least I find way better. But again, better for whom and for what? Why should there be someone who decides what is good for France and how many Starbucks we should have and how many small cafes we should have? And this is how he finishes a couple of sentences later. The trade-off between consumer welfare and intangible goods like neighborhoods and ways of living should be open to democratic choice. There may be no economic theory dictating how the choice can be made, but it can be decided through democratic political contestation. End of quote. So whether someone has the right to grow a business should be decided by democratic vote. And this is based on what principle? Why? Says who? Why is this good? We never get these answers. But you see how in the lack of guiding principles, we end up with a central planner or with a demos, the, the people who have to decide how big Amazon can get. Again, I don't see how this in any way defends anything that has to do with, uh, with liberty. We're just thinking, listening to you, it made me think that what one way to essentialize what's going on in Fukuyama's book and his whole framework is he takes for granted the mixed economy, the idea that pressure groups should have a say, rights are not really principles, you can have a right so long as it doesn't tra you know, conflict with the guy in the small shop and he should be able to say whether you open a business or not. And the, he's taking that whole context for granted and telling people who are reacting to it because they don't have enough power, they, they want more power than they have or that they, they, they have other irrational aims. He's telling them just cool off people. We need to stay in the middle. We don't want the mixed economy to get overheated. We don't want any more conflicts like this. Let's just solve the conflicts by some, what does he call it? Democratic contestation. What is that exactly? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, this is, it, it's a, Ayn Rand's term for this was it, it was a, a is a kind of civil war of pressure groups where lobbyists from one group and counter lobbyists and other interest groups they all coalesce around uh washington they try to reach the levers of power through sometimes it's through money sometimes it's through poll other kinds of illicit influence and essentially it creates a government which is a monstrosity of people exerting their will against others. And it's, it becomes a dog-eat-dog -dog situation because if you don't protect your mom and pop uh, hardware store and Home Depot comes along, well, we need a mom and pop home, uh, a hardware store union and we need our lobby. And if we don't send our lobbyists to Washington, we're gonna be screwed. And, and that, that just kind of piles on. And what you just, if you pull away the curtain and look at what actually happens in a mixed economy with pressure group warfare and it warfare is the right term for this because while it's civilized and no one's shooting bullets it really just means i get to have a say over your life i get to to cripple you if i have enough power you get to cripple me if i don't have enough power and the government becomes this is sort of the the bizarre conception of government that marxism tells us it is originally which is it's just a a, a tool of different interests wielding power now that is it, it in fact that's what we've become but that's nothing to defend that's something to to challenge and undo and put on a rational footing where there is a, a necessary and good function of government it does not look anything like that you do not want government coming in and saying well you know there, there there's so many starbucks in this town already maybe you don't need to open another one you know, let's let this guy have his shop and, and then, he, you know, he gets a sympathy and he gets, but then in another time, well, we don't have that many Starbucks, so let's have a few more in there. That's not at all a government's role is neither in economic realm nor in any realm. Uh, and so the 
Fukuyama's de- what he's trying to defend is something that shouldn't be defended. Something that should be dismantled and and changed to something good. He hasn't. He he can't see beyond the present, and it's it's it, one reaction I have to it is it's deeply unphilosophical. So it, it, as someone who's done a lot of work in political theory across the years, Fukuyama, I expected more from him, more than just a few name checks to Rousseau and Rawls, which is the book has those. But it's not really contending with what are we doing here? Is this really the way society should be framed? And it's no, well, let's just find the, the people who are going too far and the, the throw cold water on them and then just find the middle road and see if that's stable. And just one last thing on this, which is it's not just that this is a kind of civil war. Part of Ayn Rand's analysis of the mixed economy, which is distinctive, is it's unstable. It's, it's the idea that you can find some middle ground and keep it there. It's a mistake because it's the dynamics within it where people are seeking power over each other, partly through self-defense, partly because there's desire for the unearned. And just if you want to see part of her view of this, read Adler Shrugged. I mean, it's it's really powerful dramatization of what happens to a government that's lost its actual proper moral purpose. It's unstable and it's it it tends towards greater control because that's the, the, the dominant dynamic. What you need to do is neutralize that whole f- feature and pull it away and, and put it uh, on a sound footing. So the, the deep disappointment I had in this in reading this book is he, he's there's nothing here that I want to defend. There's nothing here that is good. I mean, the be- he doesn't even try to dismantle the better elements in, in our system versus the worst elements. It's just, this is what it is. Let's defend the whole thing. I don't want that. That's a package that needs to be unpacked. And Ran has mentioned it many times. She, she had quite an understanding on how these ideas tend, the half-hearted defense of a system, tend to fall in when, when someone with more solid ideas is storming the front of, uh, of history. She mentions, the Mense, she mentions the Kerensky government in Russia after the revolution and how it lost from the Bolsheviks which, by the way, wasn't inevitable. The Bolsheviks were a bunch, very few people, very weak, and yet they won. Why? From the power of their convictions, basically. And also she mentioned the example of the Weimar Republic and how it was stormed by the Nazis. And of course, if it were not stormed by the Nazis, it would be stormed by the communists. And again, the solution is not, not that, oh, therefore we have to become like the authoritarians of the left or the authoritarians of the left. But we have to understand that the world is moved, history is moved by ideas. History is moved by idealists. And again, it's such a pity that we have the good ideas. We have the bad ideas and they're not on the forefront. We are fighting this battle, this nuclear battle with graphs and with, well, we're not the wars. This is not the way to fight the battle and the results, we see them every day in the world uh, in the world out there. So there's a lot that we didn't get. To, I mean, there's one issue we didn't get to. And we should come back and do another conversation around that, which is the the whole issue of neoliberalism. I know you're interested in that, so maybe we'll we'll set up a conversation in the coming weeks around that. Let's draw a line here and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, recommend that people if if they want to read Fukuyama's book, go ahead. I don't recommend it for reasons we've just been talking about. Uh, unless you want to unpack it and, and treat it as a philosophical detection exercise where you're trying to understand where he's coming from, which is part of what motivated me. I want to tell you about some of the things we're going to be doing in the podcast and other activities. So next week, I think, is, it, is that right? Next week, we're having a Q&A session and it will be focused on free will. So uh, I think that's the basic one. But if you have other questions about the objectivist philosophy, you're welcome to send them to us. Email newideal at einrand.org, and that's also where you can send feedback and suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. We will try to respond to all of them. We definitely read all of them. So if you want to have uh, your questions about free will, Ayn Rand's distinctive and groundbreaking theory of free will, you're welcome to come and ask those then or uh, ask them in advance. We welcome the advanced questions as well. One other thing I want to tell you about before we close today is that on October 29th, which is a Saturday, we are having an event for ARI uh, members. 
which are people who give uh, recurring support to the Institute. We welcome your support if you are not already a member. It, it, it's a round table, which we have uh, basically every month. It's a get together where we have uh, interviews with people influenced by Ayn Rand, and then we have uh, an opportunity to connect with others who are like-minded. The focus of this one is a rare interview of Ayn Rand speaking in Russian to the to Russians. So this is uh, it occurred on Voice of America, and we have uh, her speaking in Russian, which I've never heard. It'd be interesting to hear and translated, so you can understand what she's saying. And we'll bring uh, uh, two. Uh, scholars who have a perspective on this. One translated it, the other is a scholar of Ayn Rand's thought who has a, a, a and, and biography. So they'll they'll provide a lot of context for both where she was, how this came about, what she was trying to do. It's a fascinating topic. I hope you'll join us for that. So that is for ARI members. If you want to become a member, this is a great opportunity to do that. So that is Saturday, October 29. And we will be back here with another podcast next time. Thanks for joining us. See you then. Bye-bye.